This is Regain Wellness Podcast with Jamie Logie. Episode 167 is the news damaging your health. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've just lost the picture, but uh, what we've seen speaks for itself. The Corvair spacecraft has apparently been taken over, conquered, if you will, by a master race of giant space ants. It's difficult to tell from this vantage point whether they will consume the captive Earthmen or merely enslave them. One thing is for certain, there is no stopping them. The ants will soon be here. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I'd like to remind them that as a trusted TV personality, uh, I can be helpful in rounding up others to toil in their underground sugar caves. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Jamie Logie. I run RegainWellness.com, and this is a Regan Wellness podcast of the same name. And so this is an interesting, I guess, discussion or topic that I kind of stumbled across in this idea of how the news um, can overwhelm you in a sense of creating a real stress and a real stress reaction in the body. and I've done a lot of shows on stress before and whether it's real or perceived, it's still, again, it has the same outcome in the body and your body still reacts the same way. And it's an interesting article I was listening to. It was um, a talk by Nora Ged Gaudis, who I've had on the show, who's as brilliant as they come and is just talking about all things like nutrition and health and this, uh, this kind of presentation on people not being aware of what this constant exposure to the news and the state of things and the, the fear mongering that happens with it, how it's actually damaging your health. And hence the uh, intro from the Homer goes to space episode where Ken Brockman with any slight reaction and the news response is just to blow things out of proportion as far as jumping to conclusions and garnering ratings and all that stuff. So this is a pretty interesting topic and one that I hadn't given a ton of thought to till I was exposed to more of this. So I'm going to cover um, what this whole issue and mindset's been about here. So the information this is all based on is from an article in The Guardian, which came out in 2013, um, written by Rolf Dobelli. And it's the, the concept of this is that the, that news is bad for you and giving up, reading it, watching it, um, consuming it can make you happier. It's bad for your health. It can lead to fear and aggression. It hinders creativity, even your ability to think deeply. And obviously the solution is to stop consuming it altogether. And this is amazing because this article is from 2013 and right now it is November 2018 and the state of the news is probably as bad as it's ever been in history. So the foresight already from this, I think, is completely related to right now. So as we look into this article and this um, research, it's just talking how in from the state of 2013, in the past few decades, few decades, the you know the fortunate among us have recognized that the you know living with an overabundance of you know food is creating obesity, diabetes, whatever. And we've, you know, started to change our diets and been proactive and everything like that. But most of us do not understand that news is to the mind what sugar is to the body. And it's a very interesting concept. In the sense, it's very easy to digest. It's quick acting, like sugar. It's a fast acting carb. News is the same thing. It's instant in the body. The media feeds us, you know, small little bites of trivial matter, tidbits that don't really concern our lives. Um, they don't require a lot of thinking. And that's why you don't really experience almost like basically no saturation from it compared to like if you're reading books um, or at least, you know, long magazine articles or long in-depth blogs, things that require thinking, you can absorb it compared to the news where they throw these little limitless quantities of flashes and bright colored infographics and essentially like they're bright colored candies for the mind. So today we've reached the same point in relation to the information that we faced 20 years ago in regards to food. We're starting to see how toxic 
it can be. And again, this is 2013 compared to the monstrosity of news issues we have at the moment. So starting off in the news in general, the news myth leads and they're looking at just this event. A car drives over a bridge and the bridge collapses. What does the news media focus on? The car, the person in the car, where he came from, where he planned to go, how he experienced the crash, if he survived it. But that's kind of all irrelevant. What is relevant? The structural stability of the bridge. That's the underlying risk that has been lurking and could lurk in other bridges. But the car is flashy, it's dramatic, it's a person, and it's news that's cheap to produce. So news leads us to walk around with the completely wrong sort of risk map in our heads. Um, it it looks at things, you know, giving the idea like, oh, chronic stress is underrated. Um, the collapse of financial institutions is overrated. Fiscal irresponsibility is underrated. Astronauts are overrated. Nurses are underrated. We're not, we're basically, we're not rational enough to be exposed to the press. So watching say in this example, they talk about an airplane crash on television is going to change your attitude toward the risk, regardless of its real probability. So if you think you can compensate with the strength of your own inner contemplation, they're saying you're wrong. Um, bankers and economists who have, you know, obviously very powerful incentives to compensate for newsborne hazards have shown um, that they cannot. So the only solution is to cut yourself off from the news and its consumption completely. So, and there's a lot of reasons why it's become an issue for people. So the, one of the big ones is news is irrelevant and out of, besides major and, and breaking stories. And even then it's, it can be a little more fear mongering based. But if you look out at, at the approximately over the course of 12 months, you're taking in around 10,000 news stories. So out of that, of those 10,000 stories you say have read in the last 12 months, name one that because you consumed it, allowed you to make a better decision about a serious matter affecting like your life, your career, or your business. You probably can't. And the point is the consumption of news is irrelevant to you, but people find it very difficult to recognize what is relevant. It's much easier to recognize what's new as opposed to what's relevant. So the relevant versus the new is basically the big, you know, sort of fundamental battle of our current media age. And media organizations want you to believe that, you know, the news offers you some sort of competitive advantage. And a lot of people fall for that. You think you're ahead of the game for some reason with a lot of information that really doesn't improve or enhance your life. And then you get anxious when you're cut off from the flow of news. And in reality, news consumption is a competitive disadvantage. The less news you consume, the bigger advantage you have. I don't know if you notice this yourself, like I'll check the news in the morning and if I have, and I, you know, try to check multiple sites and whatever. And I find sometimes if I don't do that, I feel like I am, cut off or if you don't instantly like scroll through Twitter first thing in the morning, you feel like you're out of the loop when really there's no loop to be out of per se. Um, The next item is how they're talking about news has no real explanatory power. So it's essentially like news items are bubbles popping on the surface of a deeper world. And the question is like, will accumulating facts help you understand the world? And really, it it isn't. It's like they call an inverted relationship. The important stories are non-stories. They're slow, powerful movements that develop kind of below a journalist's radar, but have a transforming effect. The more like of those little news factoids and things you digest, the less of the big picture you will understand. So, and as the author's pointing out here, if more information leads to higher economic success, we'd expect journalists to be at the top of the pyramid, and that's not the case. So then when we're looking into the, you know, some of the health effects here, there is a response in your body, and that news can be toxic to your body. And what it's doing is it's constantly triggering the limbic system. And you know those panicky, sensationalized stories spur the release of different... Um, stress hormones, things like cortisol, um, 
you know, that, that can be very damaging to your health. And I've done a lot of shows on stress and cortisol and the issues of how little stress is okay, but constant elevated stress leads to a lot of chronic problems. And I can link, I'll have a few more of those shows. If you want to check out the show notes today, which would be regainwellness.com slash 167. And I'll link up any things I'm talking about that just go a little bit deeper into it. So because the limbic system has been triggered, you have these cortisol releases, it deregulates your immune system and it inhibits the release of growth hormones. And basically you're in this chronic state, sorry, stress state. And then these high stress levels, they impair digestion. There's, you know, they delay or they prevent, you know, improved growth from cells and hair and bones. Um, you're, you have higher nervousness. You have more susceptibility to infections. You're at this kind of heightened state because you're always worried about what's happening or finding out what's happening. And then, like I said at the earlier the part of the show, the other potential side effects that trickle off from this include fear and aggression and tunnel vision and desensitization and things you've seen happen quite often at the moment. So then next thing is we're looking into what they call cognitive errors and news increases that. So news meads, sorry, news feeds the mother of all cognitive errors and they call this confirmation bias. And Warren Buffett describes this as, you know, what the human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that their prior conclusions remain intact. Like when you watch debates on TV, it, it just reinforces the original point of view. No one's ever swayed. You never see a debate and be like a person like, oh, I think you're absolutely right. I'm going to change sides on it. Or you're not even going to have your mind changed. Um, you're just looking for the inf- information that can confirm what you already know. And, you know, news um, exacerbates this flaw. So we become prone to overconfidence. You know, it can make you take stupid risks. It can, you can misjudge opportunities with this confirmation bias. And it also um, exacerbates another cognitive area called the story bias. And our brains crave stories that make sense. We need things to like fit into boxes and compartments, um, even if they don't correspond to reality necessarily. And, you know, if you have any journalist who writes the market moved because of X or the company went bankrupt because of Y can be really full of crap you, you can't explain um a lot of those things you, you know be, because we desire this like neat and tidy little package we're looking just for those answers when that you can't say the market moved because of one thing there's a ton of different variables that go into it but the news is able to sort of capitalize on your mind's demand for this simple straightforward black and white answer then getting into other things in like regarding cognitive functions and whatnot it's seen as the author points out here the news inhibits thinking so thinking requires concentration concentration requires uninterrupted time so news pieces are specifically kind of designed and engineered to interrupt you Um, it's always like why they're breaking to a story or they're cutting away to something or cutting into something they're like kind of little viruses that steal attention for their own purposes and you know, news can make people shallow thinkers and it actually goes worse than that because news can apparently severely affect your memory. So when you look at memory, there are two types of memory, long range memory, which has a capacity that's nearly infinite, but working memory is limited to a certain amount of data that can come and go pretty easily. Um, It's like a colander almost. The path from short term to long term memory is kind of a choke point in the brain, but Anything you want to understand must pass through it. So if this passageway is disrupted, nothing really gets through. Um, Because news disrupts your concentration, it weakens your comprehension. And the online news is apparently having even a worse impact. And this goes, this is a study done in Canada. And it goes to, let's see, this is 2001. So, I mean, we're, we're in the early days of the internet. I don't even remember the first time you even, do you even remember the first time you went online? I think for, I remember going in high school, there was one computer. This is way back. This is like, I want to say like 96. And there was one computer in the entire school that had internet. 
I remember going down into the computer lab. You had to sign up and you can only get 10, I think you had like 10 minutes max at a time. And this was like dripping a slow internet connectivity. I can't remember what the different terms are for um, internet speed, but obviously dial up. And I remember the only website address I'd ever heard of was toystory.com because they were one of the first movie campaigns that was incorporating this new internet to learn more information. So I went on it and it probably took like five minutes for the thing to load. So 2001, it's still early days. They don't even know what's ahead of them here. And in this study, they showed that um, comprehension declines as the number of hyperlinks in a document increases. And why is this? It's because whenever a link appears, your brain has to at least make the choice not to click it, which in itself is distracting. And news has this intentional interruption system. So in today, again, this is 2001. Today, the links are an onslaught. Like if you go on to CNN.com or any news site, not just like from a pop-up standpoint, but like um, paid advertisements where it's almost hard to decipher what is the news and what's not the news. Like what is paid content, which is an advertisement disguised as news. Or, I mean, clickbait is the ultimate way. It's as we've moved everything online as opposed to watching TV more, the w- demand to grab your attention is higher than ever. With TV, it's very easy because you're already locked in. Ultimately, they just don't want you to change the channel. Um, but if you're in there, they can hit you with the commercials right away. On the internet, it's so hard. So that's why clickbait is so big. And I've been a victim of it too because, like, of all the articles I write, or, you know, I write for places like the Huffington Post or. Um, life hack or my own site and you need to grab people's attention right away and people tend to do it with sensationalized headlines because at least they can get you in more clicks usually may, means more views um, and then it gets into things advertisements online and things called like Google AdSense basically it all it's basically ratings and that's the way to look at the internet clicks equal ratings um, so whatever they can do to draw you in, at least to get you on the page, and then maybe from there to click something else. And the more things you click, the more money revenue you generate and all that sort of stuff. So so our, it, it's just like an avalanche of this stuff when you're online. I don't know if you watch South Park. If you don't, no problem. But they did an actually amazing show about this whole thing, about how the news was turning into this artificial intelligence and ads – and the real news where you couldn't differentiate them and that the ads were taking over the whole world because, you know, you click on them, think you're getting the news and then you know, you're going into like, oh, the 10 worst celebrity facelifts. And then you go to that and then it's this trickle down effect. So inter- interesting thing that this study would come from 2001 and they have no idea what was ahead of them after this. Um, so next thing when we're looking into the cognitive issue Um, and your brain is that news actually can work like a drug. So as stories develop, we want to know how they continue. Again, it's kind of that our bodies are kind of hardwired to want conclusion and and see stories and and structure. So with hundreds of like arbitrary storylines in our heads, this craving is increasingly compelling and hard to ignore. So scientists used to think that the dense connections formed along with the, you know, 100 billion neurons inside our skulls were largely fixed by the time we reached adulthood. Today, we know it's not the case. We know nerve cells routinely break old connections and form new ones. So the more news we consume, the more we exercise the neural circuits devoted to skimming and multitasking, so multitasking, while ignoring those used for reading deeply thinking, thinking with a profound focus, things like that. So most news consumers, even if they used to be avid book readers, have lost the ability to absorb lengthy articles or books. After four or five pages, they get tired, their concentration vanishes, they become restless. It's not because they got older, their schedules became different or whatever. It's because the physical structure of your brain can actually change. And I know I've noticed this myself because I've read all the time. And sometimes when I get away from it for a while, when I get back to a book, I find it so hard to refocus because we're used to consuming information in these little chunks. And it's so, and again, if you read a lot online, it's the way things are broken up. And this is something I've had to learn as I've written for these online publications. It, there's a structure to writing for the internet compared to if I was writing um, a book or a real like in-depth 
insight blog posts. Most like there's so much thing, so many things that are vying for your attention. And I'll just say one site I write for, and they really push this is that you don't write more than three sentences in a paragraph because people are like almost physically exhausted by seeing a huge block of text. Think of it yourself. Like if you're looking at something on a screen and it's just this massive thing with no um, breaks and paragraphs, it's so overwhelming. You're probably not going to read it. And most people, when you're on ri- online, you don't read, you skim. So when I have to write for these places, you have to hit these big bolded, um, sort of captions before paragraphs. So the person knows if it's worth going into that. So Sam writing, I'm just, Sam writing about this is just off the top of my head, like sugar. And, you know, I go into this intro and talking about the problems of sugar. And then I need these head like headings within it. So if you're scrolling through, it says, um, this is how much sugar you're probably eating. And you're like, Oh, that's interesting. I want to see. So you go into the next paragraph and get some more information you scroll down and the next next big headline and these are you know in the larger size fonts and everything to stick out through the article you know the next headline might be here's how sugar is made and you're like ah oh, that's not as interesting you keep scrolling um and you're like the next headline in the article will be like this is how much damage is actually happening you're like oh that intrigues me so you jump in so it's, i mean people are just like skimming down and looking for things that stand out. So like when you write online, you have to hit all these big headlines, not have a huge um, paragraph set up. Like it has to be broken down two to three sentences max because you get tired from reading. You're just not used to reading in the way you previously were. Again, with a lot of these sites, it's encouraged to have a lot of images in it. You know, it, it, it seems to be a, a very primary mindset, and that's happened. I, the usual understanding is that when you read, say, newspapers, they were generally always written at a sixth grade reading level, which is what the average person reads at. I, I'm interested in what that is now because as our attention spans and, and brains have almost converted more to this style of focus – we need more, you know, you need videos interlaid in, you need more um, infographics, stuff like that, just to break up um, this focus, which our, our minds have trouble doing. I don't know if you're the same, like you might notice this now when you read, it can only be for a certain amount of time. And the other day I did this and this is humiliating, but I was act, I was holding an actual physical picture, like a photo print picture. Young people, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. And I want like I felt like I had to look in closer, and I actually subcon like subconsciously moved my hands to pinch and zoom on it, like I would on my phone. And like, what the hell am I doing? It see, see how much our brains have been converted to consuming <laughs> and reacting to information this way. So I don't know. I probably get more deeper into that, but whatever. Um, the next thing here is. Obviously, news wastes a lot of time. If you read the newspaper for 15 minutes each morning, then you check the news for 15 minutes during lunch, you scroll on your phone, um, five minutes here, 10 minutes there, you're on Twitter, Facebook, which has become a big, honestly, like um, news consolidator as well. You know, add that in when you're at work, count the distractions, you have to refocus again. You can lose at least a half day every week from all this. Information is no longer a scarce commodity. It's everywhere. <clears throat> if you're holding your phone right now, I'm holding mine right now, looking at it. everything that's ever happened ever. that's ever been created. Any information in the history of the world, you can check on this thing right now. So information is no longer scarce, but attention is. So, you know, the, the point like in this article saying you're not, irresponsible with other things like money, your health, hopefully your reputation. So why give away your mind to this style of thinking? Next thing is the news makes us passive. So again, news stories are overwhelmingly about things you cannot influence. The daily repetition of news about things we can't act upon actually can make you passive and it grinds you down until you sort of adopt this worldview that is pessimistic, desensitized, sarcastic, and fatalistic. Does this sound familiar? This kind of what we're observing at the moment. The scientific term is actually called learned helplessness. So, you know, the author says here, it might be a bit of a stretch, but he would not be surprised if news consumption at least partially contributes to the widespread disease of depression. This sort of 
sense of helplessness that's been brought on by the news, maybe that's responsible. I mean, that's a bigger, bigger question, but it's interesting that he brings this up. Next thing here, again, as the article winds down, a big one, news kills. And the author is uh, very aware of the irony of writing this on a media website, the Guardian being, Guardian.com being a massive big one, but you know, it's the only way to really share information and finishing with the idea that news kills creativity. So we know, uh, we already know limit to our creative creativity. Um, this is the one reason that, you know, like mathematicians, composers, entrepreneurs usually produce their most creative works at a younger age. If you look at your favorite bands and whatever, um, as time goes on, your creativity can dwindle, not always, but, you know, at the younger age, your brain enjoys a wide sort of uninhabited space, um, able to help you come up and pursue more novel ideas. And it, it, the idea is that a lot of, you know, really creative minds um, who, you know, you hard to find some who are real news junkie, not, you know, writers, composer, composers, mathematicians, physicians, painters, musicians, like everyone, they tend not to be news junkies um, by definition. They they don't let all this outside noise block their creativity because either they're acutely aware it does or they're subconsciously aware and they've made that choice not to do it. But on the other hand, if you can think, <laughs> probably it doesn't take uh, a lot of time to think of um, viciously uncreative people um, and uncreative minds who consume news like drugs, they kind of seem to go hand in hand. If you want to come up with old solutions, read the news. If you're looking for new solutions, don't. And he finishes up by saying society needs journalism, but in a different way now. So investigative journalism is always relevant, but we need reporting that kind of polices our institutions and uncovers truths. Um, but important findings don't have to arrive in the form of news. You can still get, you know, long journal articles, in-depth books, even, you know, good eBooks can do the trick too. And amazingly, this guy who's <laughs> written on the guardian says he's gone without news for four years. And so he can see and feel and report the effects of the freedom firsthand. And he reports less disruption, less anxiety, deeper thinking, more time, more insights. Ultimately, how it's really not easy because you're breaking this real habit, but in the long end or the end of the line, it is worth it. So I love this article. I loved all these insights and, and kind of my extra two cents with it too is as I talk about this distress, like he touches on the stress issue and we're really seeing again, like perceived or real stress, it doesn't matter. It, it happens in the body. The reaction is the exact same way and can lead to all this inflammation and inflammation is seen to be at the root of all, you know, all these horrible diseases and conditions. Um, and as of right now, and in, in this year, not wanting to go too much on a tangent, it's maybe a bit worse or as bad as it's ever been. And I don't know if that's because of our overexposure to it. I was thinking if you, I don't know if anyone watched that Vietnam special on Netflix and just talking about the, and the whole issue of the seventies and you're looking at that and, and Nixon and Watergate, if we had, I mean, back then there were three news channels, there was no internet, limited amount of information, um, and a lot of despair and hopelessness and whatever. So if we had the onslaught of media from today back at that time, I don't know. I almost think it might've been potentially worse, but we have these, you know, 24 hour news channels, um, a ton of online publications and things that just have to fill time and ultimately hit the bottom line. All these, you know, whether it's CNN or NBC or Fox or whatever, they're all owned by larger giant corporations. And I don't think knowledge and information is really their goal to provide you with, you know, their it's dollars and cents at the end of the day to, keep shareholders happy, stock prices up like that. And I think ultimately that's what's behind everything. And they know sensationalistic news works best. And it's that old, you know, if it bleeds, it leads stories. You know, news channels could fill their entire day with happy, 
feel good stories, but that doesn't create the same reaction as um, drama and despair and stuff like that, that lot that tends to lock people in more. It creates a stronger reaction. And then again, like as Eric was saying, in that sense, you need to find out more. You need to know where this is going. And if you don't, you're somehow um, completely out of the loop. So it's, you know, you're looking at corporations and news agencies and stuff like that, that need to keep your attention as much as possible. And at this day and age, in 2018, with a certain Cheeto colored president, um, this has been like a gold mine for them. Because if you look at CNN, when they're doing, I hate talking about this, but like when they're doing stories related to to the political climate right now and talking about Trump and whatnot, the ratings are like sky high. As soon as they, st- you can see these on, on, online in the graphics, as soon as they cut away from that, their la- the ratings plummet. So on the one hand, they're talking about how much they despise and hate everything in this, but in for the bottom line, it's been a massive boom because of the interest and intrigue and people need to tune in to find out what's happening. And ultimately with these big corporations is, you know, if they're selling things that generate fear, um, in the end, fear leads to consumption. So in the case of like, you know, media conglomerates and whatever, they have these stories of, of despair and hopelessness and whatever. And this is, um, how will we bounce back and whatever boom right into the commercial, you know, buy the Lexus, buy the new iPhone. These are the solutions to that fear is the consumption. Um, and then that goes hand in hand with that, that basic idea of what marketing is and, and, and business and maybe marketing and business and news media are all the same thing. So at the core business is to identify a problem, provide a solution. So, you know, that's very simple. You have snow on your driveway. How are you going to clear it? Boom, we invented, here's a shovel that can scoop through ice. Done, no problem. But in the case of uh, sort of modern era, I think they're creating um, and identifying problems that don't really exist and kind of placing them on you. And then they're, they're creating that by bombarding you with images about like, Here's what beauty should look like. Here's what happiness should look like. Stuff like that. And kind of wearing you down, wearing you down. And then boom, here's a solution. You know, get this makeup. Um, here's this medication that'll do the trick. Buy the Apple Watch. That'll make you happier. And, and it's sort of this core vicious cycle thing that goes around. And I think the news has the ability to kind of draw you in, especially at the moment, um, to kind of create a little more of that fear and a little more of that sensationalism. And they're all guilty of it. If you remember um, not long ago with the, I mean, every time hurricanes come up, they're, they're all, I mean, these are always bad and, and not, you know, disregarding any of the, the problems that have happened in certain areas, but they always are always overhyped and then they don't turn out as big as they say because they can generate that fear and they're selling that fear mongering again and then bringing that in. And then the, you know, that leading to the consumption. I don't know if you remember the last, I forget which um, hurricane we're looking at here, but CNN had this thing and they're reporting it. And there's a, a report outside and he's like trying to stand up against the winds. Like he's, it's this torrential um, category five thing and he's going to get blown away and he's fighting. And in the background, these two guys just, casually walk by even wearing shorts um, because they're just (laughs) overselling this thing so much because they need to, they know they need to have people drawn in um, for that fear leading to that consumption and the whole thing. I mean, it's probably, you know, ultimately a dollars and cents thing at the end of the day. Um, If you think even back to something like, yeah, hurricanes are so bad for this on the news media. If you think something like back to like Y2K, if you're a millennial and listening to this, put down the avocado toast and you might have to go ask your parents. But if you remember the Y2K, the over hysteria and fear and people were stocking their basements with like canned goods and water and everything because they don't, you know, people were building bunkers and because they didn't know, you know, if things were just going to go completely haywire and planes are going to start falling out of the sky. Absolutely nothing happens. There's that, there's that, <laughs> this idea. I hadn't heard this till 
recently where the idea of Y2K was apparently um, generated up by some of the tech and computer companies knowing that um, they could create this hysteria and people weren't really sure how to react and it would create all this massive business for them to go in and to fix software. Um, entire businesses and industries were were created just for the Y2K thing to go in and, and solve um, and change data so that you were Y2K compliant when the when the switchover happened. And then obviously nothing happened. So it's just it's a weird time. And if you look at the the news media and these and again like you know CNN or Fox or whatever, they they stand on one side of the line and they're and they're very adamant on what their direction is um, and their motivations are. But ultimately, all these um, networks and whatever are still looking for the buck at the end of the day and they're just doing it in the way they see is most fit and it's um a good business time for any media outlets because they can just report on anything trump related and people just flock in as much as they say they hate it and some say like saturday night live i don't know if you watch that who's traditionally like you know very um liberal left-wing thinking whatever they make their stance very well known and you know they hate the political climate but the core of their show is all based around that and it's been the best thing for their ratings in the last three years so you know it's funny on one side you think they would just you know try and completely ignore and not bring attention to it but in the long run it helps their bottom line and the fact their ratings are so high which is incredible in this day and age where people really don't watch a lot of live tv and especially on a saturday night so the fact people are tuning in is a big deal. If you just think, however, you know, different things are to take your attention and ratings are just not what they used to be. If, if you think like, say in the 80s, the 70s or 80s, there was only like three networks. So on any given night, a third of the entire viewing country is watching whatever it was, even if it was a piece of crap, like the Brady Bunch Variety Hour or whatever. So today where, you know, three or four million viewers is considered pretty good and anything of like 10 to 11 million is considered like through the roof ratings where in the 80s just the average run of the mill even rerun show was doing like 40 to 60 million people if they had ratings of like 11 people everyone would be fired and the the complete network would be turned upside down so just that outlets like this are banking on this um kind of chaos and stuff that's happening right now because it's a way to draw those eyes in it's the ultimate in clickbait it's like real life clickbait and and the news um can absolutely capitalize on it so i'll cut it off there just so hopefully this doesn't hasn't gone off on a, just like a complete bender here but it, it's something i've been more aware of now as i was exposed to more of this information um and uh, this constant state of distress that's in a lot of people's bodies because of the state of things and you know if things are bad they're bad but sometimes is it more the constant awareness of it as opposed, you know, to the actual situations that aren't as bad. We're, we're just, we're so overexposed and it really, and you know, based on a lot of this information here, it's doing some damage um, when it's not even providing you anything in the long run. So that's it. I don't know if you have any thoughts, I'd be interested to hear, um, Share them. You can email me anytime to info at regainwellness.com. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the show. Anywhere you get podcasts, I mean, whatever you're listening to on right now, you can probably subscribe there. Probably Apple Podcasts, but everything like Stitcher, iHeartRadio, everything like that. If you really like it, give a rating review. More people get to see it that way. Um, and again, like anything I talked about here on the show notes would be regainwellness.com slash 167. That's it for me. See ya.